unorthodox research got out of control. Some of these CI people decided to administer LSD in the after-dinner drink for several of the scientists there who had no experience with LSD. And one of those scientists, Dr. Frank Olson, had a very difficult uh, experience. You might call it a bad trip. When he reported back to work on Monday, he exhibited such erratic behavior that his superiors contacted the CIA for help. They spent a couple of weeks babysitting him, uh, and then in early December, he plunged to his death from a uh, 10th floor of a hotel in New York City. Uh, he, it seemed that he committed suicide. Uh, that was the understanding later on when some of this information came out. You have to understand, this was a hot potato the CIA was dealing with. You had a, a scientist from the Army given LSD as a part of one of these CIA experiments, who ends up uh, dying as a result. There's some controversy now whether he actually threw himself out of the window or whether he was pushed. For more than two decades, the CIA hid facts surrounding Olson's death. In the early 1970s, news reports provoked congressional hearings on the incident. President Gerald Ford personally apologized to the Olson family, and in 1976, Congress passed a bill to pay $750,000 in compensation to Mrs. Olson and her three children. Still, the Olsons doubted the suicide story. They thought Olson was pushed from the hotel window because he posed a security risk. The family doggedly investigated the incident, and in 1994, after exhuming Frank Olson's body, an autopsy raised enough questions about foul play that the New York District Attorney agreed to reopen the case. But Olson's death didn't stop the CIA's so-called research in the 1950s. Its next project, called Operation Midnight Climax, saw CIA operatives persuade prostitutes to slip LSD to unsuspecting customers in brothels set up by the agency. People from the CIA would sit behind two-way mirrors and watched all the action, both the drugging and the sex. And this is not a great way to gather information from a scientific point of view, but this is what the CIA felt it had to do to get information on what would happen when LSD was given to people surreptitiously. And because they knew they had to know this before they would actually use it in this way in the operations. Although extremely unethical, this type of secret operation was defended within the agency as being important for national defense. It was one of their deepest held secrets that they were doing this, but because of the Cold War, they really felt no stone unturned, no weapon kept in the holster, no tool kept in the shed. Uh, if this was, you know, this was going to be useful, we should study it. And there was also the feeling that if we're not studying it, the enemy is. At this time, Another group was also researching LSD with entirely different results. In the mental health profession, some used it as a tool to tap the unconscious mind. It seemed to speed up the process. It, it's, uh, you could give small doses of LSD in a, in a typical shrink's office and over the course of several weeks do several years' work. They learned that the patient's moods and the setting in which the drug was administered had enormous effects on the patient's reactions. LSD seems to amplify everything. You want to have a safe, supportive setting with beautiful aesthetic objects around music and so forth. And to set and setting are right, and you have the guidance uh, and the assistance of, of others who are more experienced, then you have the potential for really understanding how your mind works. No wonder the CIA's experiments tended to provoke bad reactions while other LSD users had a blissful experience. By giving the drug in a hostile environment, the CIA almost guaranteed a negative reaction. In 1957, a new term was coined by Dr. Humphrey Osmond to describe drugs like LSD and mescaline, psychedelic. It means mind manifesting, suggesting the drugs do not produce a predictable sequence of events but instead bring to the surface unconscious thoughts and feelings. By the late 1950s, psychedelic therapy was popular. Many who used it experienced changes in personality, religious and philosophical beliefs, and sometimes lifestyle. In Hollywood, therapists made the drug available to celebrities, including Cary Grant, Rita Moreno, Andre Previn, and even Time Life publisher Henry Luce. 
Grant, who reportedly took more than 100 LSD trips, claimed LSD was the only therapy he tried that gave him peace of mind. One Californian therapist, Dr. Oscar Janiger, realized the drug was not always predictable. I emphatically do not believe that everybody should have LSD. There are people who are living on the fringe of reality who will knock them over into a cocktail. But others, like Dr. Timothy Leary, began their long, strange trip. He felt that he had merged with the Godhead, that he had seen the light, and that it was his job now to turn on everybody. Timothy Leary was the man whose name became synonymous with psychedelic drugs. He first came into contact with them while on holiday in Mexico in 1960. Recently appointed to a lectureship at Harvard University, he appeared to have an academic future ahead of him. But he was bored and dissatisfied. He was just looking for something to happen. Timothy Leary had one of the great midlife crises of our time. He was 40 years old when he first took the magic mushroom. Leary first read about psilocybin mushrooms in an article published in Life magazine in 1957. On holiday, he decided to try them. His encounter with the mushroom was nothing short of profound. He later said it was without question the deepest religious experience of his life. Yeah, the idea came up when he had this life change, what he called a life-changing experience, in Mexico on a summer vacation with the magic mushroom, um, he decided to, vote, to devote his life to exploring the potentials of this as a tool. The effect is somewhat like looking through a microscope. Suddenly, uh, when you look through a microscope, you discover that there's an invisible world around you that you hadn't uh, known about before you did it. The same thing is true with a psychedelic drug. Leary set up the Harvard Psilocybin Research Project a wide ranging study to investigate the emotional and creative effects of a mushroom pill. Leary's timing couldn't have been better. Albert Hoffman, the chemist who discovered LSD, had recently learned how to synthesize psilocybin. He thought of himself as, a, as an ambitious scientist. He thought he'd found a substance that would allow him to change behavior. And that was really his main interest as a psychologist. Not just understanding people, but in taking somebody who was deeply disturbed or deeply unhappy and fundamentally changing their behavior. In 1961, Leary gave psilocybin to convicts as part of an experiment to reform them. I remember him saying, let's see if we can turn the convicts into Buddhas uh, by giving them this profound religious experience, insight, and maybe they will change their way. The experiment took place at Massachusetts Correctional Institute in Concord, where psilocybin was given to 32 inmates. The idea was that the drug would alter their personalities, so on release they would not reoffend. Leary and his group often took the drug with the prisoners, acting as guides through the experience. In the short term, only 25% of those who took the drug returned to prison, compared to the normal 80%. But critics dispute the results because Leary got involved in the ex-convicts' lives, unintentionally skewing the outcome. It was learned that after they did get out, Leary and his graduate students helped get them jobs. The rather extraordinary results of the prison project were generally criticized on, on that factor. In early 1962, the British writer Aldous Huxley met a researcher who had been experimenting with LSD and sent him off to introduce Leary to the powerful hallucinogen. He felt that he had merged with the Godhead, that he had seen the light, and that it was his job now to turn on everybody, to turn on the whole world so that they could share this wonderful experience. Suddenly he was not talking about making convicts uh, better citizens, he was talking about changing the whole religious, political, cultural structure of the United States. Leary was no longer a passive scholar. He became the voice of the psychedelic vision. He was on a path that would make him the leader of a revolution. So he had uh, charisma to burn. Uh, he was an Irish philosopher, poet, who, who had an incredible gift of oratory. He was one of the most brilliant speakers, and it would be kind of an almost electrical 
charge in the room as he would talk about that and almost like an, a mystical experience would occur right there and then even just through his talking about it a large crowd of people who would be eating out of his hand everything you've heard about the dangers of lsd is an outright hoax and a lie lsd is not as dangerous as color television championing this new cool